All right, moving on. I think we're online now. Hope we're online. Yep, live on Facebook. Let me just check. Yes, we are online. Okay, just give me one second. Here I am. And we will mute everybody. Okay, welcome to the evening Bhagavad Gita study, seminar, discussion, whatever. And we are continuing with the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Actually, let me put my other screen on. It's better to see you all with. Okay. So we are continuing with the chapter 13 uh, of the Bhagavad Gita. And now we will chant Jai Radha Madhava. Jai Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Gopi Janabalaba Giri Bharadhaji Gopi Jana Balaba Giri Bharadhaji Asuna Nandana Raja Janu Ranjana Asuna Nandana Raja Janu Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Ran Humad Hova Kunya Vihati Jaya Ran Humad Hava Kunya Vihati Gopi Janavalaba Giri Vadadhati Gopi Janavala Maha Giri Bhadadhati Yashoda Nandana Vraja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Vraja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Rad Umad Hova Kunyabi Hari Jaya Rad Ramad Hava Kunyabi Hari Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahansa Paravitacharya Osna Teta Sabashi Shimad his divine grace of Ayah Chalana Ravatamananda Gosami. Shila Prabhupad Gijai. Iskan, founder Acharya, Shila Prabhupad Gijai, Nandagoti, Vaishnav, Vrinda Gijai, Namacharya, Shrahila, Stakur Gijai. Friends, say Kahoshi Krishna Chaitanya. Prabhu Nichananda Shidwaiti Gadadha, Shiva Siddhi Gaul, Bhaktavan Gijai, Shishi Radhakrishna, Go, Piko, Banach, I'm Kun Vedakun, Makiri Govardhani Gijai. Vrindavanam Kijai, Maturam Kijai, Dilavasami Kijai, Yuvanamai Kijai, Shimadi Lassi Devi Kijai, Samaveda Bhakta, Vrindi Kijai, Gold, Premananda, Hari Hari Hari. All glories to the symbol of the Bhutis. All glories to the symbol of the Bhutis. All glories to the symbol of the Bhutis. All glories to Shi Guru and Gold Ranga, Shila Prabhupad Kijai, Gold, Premananda, Hari Hari Hari. Ma'om Vishnu Padai Krishna Prasthaya Bhujai Shri Madhya Bhakti Padanta Swamadhi Namadhi 
Namaste, Saraswati Deva, Gauravani Pacharani, Neva Sesha, Shunyabadi, Paschacha, Deja Tarani, Shilapopad Kijai. Actually, I just want to get a little water before I start class. So, Omagana Timirandasha Gananjana Shalakaya Chaksura Meditam Yena Tasmai Shi Gurave Namaha. So, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who kindly opened my eyes with a torch light of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So, we are continuing with the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, and interestingly enough, it's text 13, 13, 13, because we went through 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 over the, the last two days, actually, and these were describing all the different qualities that a Vaishnava manifests, and especially the quality of unalloyed, uninterrupted devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Okay, so now we're on text 13. I yeam yatat pravachami yat yato ram vitam nasnate anadi mat param brahma nasatana saduchate. Agyayam, the noble yat which taught that pravakshami, I shall now explain yat which, jatva, knowing, amritam, nectar, ashnute, one taste, anadi, beginningless, matparam, subordinate to me, brahma, spirit, na, neither, sat, cause, tat, that, na, nor, asat, effect, uchate, is said to be. <coughs> Translation. I shall now explain the knowable, knowing which you will taste the eternal. Wow. Brahman, the spirit, beginningless and subordinate to me, lies beyond the cause and effect of this material world. So let's talk for a second about what Brahman is. It says the spirit. It doesn't mean the ghost. Brahman is, basically the word means the greatest. So. It refers to spiritual entities, actually. Brahman is never impersonal. Just like one may perceive, uh, let's say, a light coming from some place, or let's say, from a bunch of fireflies. Fireflies are flies that produce light. And they all, all this light may be merged, but as you get closer, you'll see individual fireflies. So the same thing with Brahman. Although to some it appears to be undifferentiated, that means just one, it is actually differentiated and Brahman is always personal. But Brahman means spiritual, and the spiritual entity and entities are beginningless on an individual basis and beginningless in a uh, combined basis. And all these entities and all the energies and the spiritual world, which is also Brahman, they're all subordinate to Krishna, because Krishna is the Parabrahman, the Supreme Brahman. We are ordinary Brahman, and Krishna is the Supreme Brahman. Let me just turn this thing off. We have to close up. We have to, okay, that was important. Because if I don't close Outlook, then I will end up, oops, where are we? Oops, did I close something else there? No. Yeah, here we go. So uh, anyway, so in this material world, the final portion of this sentence is uh, we, everything is controlled by cause and effect. Everything has a cause, and every cause is an effect. But spiritual reality 
has no cause and no material effect. It's hard to conceive. It's impossible for us to conceive with our material brains. Of course, it's stated in the Brahma Samhita, Krishna is the cause of all causes, which means that nothing causes Krishna. So that's beyond our understanding. Just like the scientists talked about the beginning of matter, the cosmos, like that, and they said all of a sudden there was an explosion from nothing. And, of course, they also talk about how um, the time-space continuum and gravity is like the bending of the time-space continuum. Believe me, I'm not going to start talking about it right now. But what does that mean exactly? I mean, yes, mathematically, we who understand mathematics can analyze it, but what does it actually mean? It's inconceivable. And even when you're dealing with mathematics, which actually I did study, you know, much to my consternation when I went to the university, I, uh, we were studying uh, multidimensional calculus, which means you can have an infinite number of dimensions. So mathematically, you can compute all this, uh, this, all this stuff about infinite number of dimensions or many uh, dimensions. But as far as conceiving, wait a minute, this thing keeps jumping. Hold on a second. As far as conceiving what it means or picturing what it means to have many dimensions, that's impossible for us. I mean, we can basically understand what three dimensions are. Three dimensions? No, backwards and forwards, left and right, up and down. They're the three axes. The X, Y, and Z, for those of you who study graphs, three axes. So when you start talking about more axes, I mean, just, but you, but mathematically, yes, we can actually deal with it, and I, and I have dealt with it in the past. But perceptually or conceptually, mm -mm, there's no way you can deal with it. Because you're limited. Anyway, so anyway, so we're talking about something beyond cause and effect. You gotta accept it on faith because we have no experience of it in this world. No experience of something beyond cause and effect. So purport, the Lord has explained the field of activities and the knower of the field. Of course, the body is a field of activities, knower of the field is us. Of course, there's also the knower of the field. He's the super knower of all the fields, as well as the knower of our particular field. He has also explained the process of knowing the knower of the field of activity. Now he begins to explain the knowable, first the soul and then the super soul, that's Paramatma. By knowledge of the knower. In other words, the person who knows the field. As we said, there's two entities that know the field. The soul and Krishna. I'm pointing to Krishna right now too. Not that I think I'm Krishna, but within my heart, there's the little BKG soul, and then there's the K-soul, the Krishna soul. Oh, one can relish the nectar of life. As explained in the second chapter, the living entity is eternal. This is also confirmed here. There is no specific date at which the jiva was born. Because there's no time in the spiritual realm. Uh, time is, um, is manifest by its absence. It's, in other words, prominent in the spiritual realm because it's absent. What do you mean by prominent? You notice there's no time. So, uh, nor can anyone trace out the history of the Jivatma's manifestation from the Supreme Lord. Therefore, uh, there's no specific date at which the Jiva was born. No one can trace out the history of the Jivatma's manifestation from the Supreme Lord. Therefore, it is beginningless, beyond time. The Vedic literature confirms this. The Jayate, Mrite, Va, Vipaschya. That's from the Katha Upanishad 1-2-18 which is similar to the Bhagavad Gita, the second chapter, in the Jayate Mriyate Vakadachin, Nayam Bhutva Bhavita Vana Bhuyha, Jognitya Shashruta Yam Parana, Hanyate Hanyamane Shirirai, which you all learned, I'm sure, when we went through the second chapter of the Gita. The knower of the body is never born and never dies, and he is full of knowledge. 
the Supreme Lord is the super soul, is also stated in the Vedic literature, Svetasvatara Upanishad 6.16, to be Padana Chitragya Patir Gunesha, the chief knower of the body and master of the three modes of material nature. So Padana, uh, that's the Padan, the mm, material cause of the universe, Shetragya, the knower, Patir, Shetragya, Pradana Shetragya Patir means the master of the material world and the individual soul. And also Ganeshaha. He's also the knower and the controller and the Patir, you know, just like a, this is funny, please forgive me for this, but if when people are married in India or let's say in Vedic culture, whoever knows what Vedic culture is, uh, the husband is called Pati. Pati means like master. And sometimes the husband is called Pati Guru. And sometimes the wife, in an affectionate term, is calling the husband Pati. And the husband affectionately calls the wife Priya. So anyway, so he makes it. So Krishna is the master and the knower. Kosheitragya, he's the knower, master, uh, and also of the Guneshaha, of the modes of material nature. So this is probably translated. The chief knower of the body and the master of the three modes of material nature. In the Smriti, it is said, Dasa Bhuto Harer Eva Nanyasaiva Kadachana. The living entities are eternally in the service of the Supreme Lord. That's Dasa, means servants. Vasa Bhuta Harer, that's Krishna. At any time, Kadachana. That means at all times, basically. There's no time, Kadachana, in which they are not in the service of the Lord. This is interesting. This is also conferred by Lord Chaitanya in his teachings. What does he say? Jivana Sarupohe Nitya Krishna. Our constitutional position is we are servants of Krishna. And we are thinking we are servants of our body. We are servants of our tongue. Tongue das. We are servants of our family. We are servants of our nation. We are servants of humanity. But we are servants of Krishna. And that's the way to render service to everybody. Therefore, this description of the Brahman mentioned in this verse is in relation to the individual soul. And when the word Brahman is applied to the living entity, is to be understood that he is Vijnana Brahma, as opposed to Ananda Brahma. Okay. So... In this particular context, vijnana means one who has the realization that he's the soul, as opposed to the blissful uh, topmost living entity. Ananda Brahma is the supreme Brahman personality of Godhead. That means we're meant to know the Lord, and once we know the Lord, then we can experience Ananda. Got it? Because we all want to be happy. The reason we're suffering Okay, let's get into a little bit of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. How about that? If you're interested, get a copy of my book. But anyway, the reason we're suffering is because our needs are not being met. And what are those needs? Well, there's physical needs, mental needs, spiritual needs, and ultimately, the need for love. And that love can be manifested or focused on Krishna. And once it's focused on Krishna, then guess what? That need for love is just, boom, got it. Then you're completely in love all the time. And then that's Ananda. Just like in the material world, when people fall in love, remember that expression? Fall in love. Devotees rise in love, not fall in love. So when people fall in love, then there's some glimmer of happiness in the beginning, because that's passion. Later on in the Gita, we're going to hear about happiness in the mode of passion. Happiness in the mode of passion is like nectar in the beginning. Sounds good, doesn't it? But then it's like poison. 
Yeah, just like when we're hankering for something, our tongue or our belly or our genital is hankering for something, and we finally get it. It's nectar. Oh, no. And then, what did I do? Ooh, like poison. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so, and happiness in the mode of goodness and transcendental goodness, in the beginning, is a little painful. Sometimes, you know, it's described in the Gita, it's like poison in the beginning. Oh, my God. No intoxication. No illicit life. No gambling. No gambling is easy. No meat eating. The charades. That's, oh, that's an easy one. That's probably the easiest one. Okay, that, that and gambling, you know, those two, you know, okay, we can do without it. So intoxication, you know, illicit sex, that's the tough one for many people. Anyway, so uh, once you progress, you know, rise above the modes of nature, rise in the mode of goodness, uh, and you fulfill your basic needs, Basic needs have nothing to do with meat, fish, or eggs, intoxication, or sex, and gambling. Basic needs have to do with shelter, food, autonomy, uh, friendship, uh, play, recreation, meaning in life. See, a lot of the reasons people are miserable is because they have no meaning in life. Like if you ask people, what's the meaning of your life? What's the purpose of your life? At one time, Prabhupada asked one of the employees of uh, Dynapon, which is a printing business, you know, one of the lower echelon employees, he asked, you know, what is the meaning of your life? And this man took a stack of business cards of his associates and himself and took his own card from the bottom and put it on the top, and that's the meaning of his life. That's a very bad meaning. So the, what happens in Japan sometimes, this is interesting, is when uh, the rug is pulled out from under someone. That is, you know, their meaning of life no longer become practical, possible, attainable, uh, or they lose it. It's very common that people commit suicide. Not only in Japan, but you know, in Japan is probably uh, was at least more prominent than it is now. Because you hear about people, big companies, and they get caught doing something, and they end up killing themselves. In America, it happens too. People end up killing themselves when they get discovered or do something because their meaning in life has been taken away from them. But Krishna consciousness can never be taken away. Even, let's say, all right, let's say you really, your meaning in life is to become Krishna conscious and everything like that, and you slip. Slip a little bit. A lot. And then, but you don't lose it. You just come back. Pick up where you left off. It's not that you get kicked out of your position. The whole world's making fun of you, and there's no way you're going to become president and CEO of uh, Microsoft again, or president of the United States again. You know, once you're gone, you know, some people, after they've been president, maybe get put in prison. We'll see. So their whole meaning of life is finished. The meaning of life is just to be famous, to have everybody appreciate them, to be the boss. This is a horrible perspective, a horrible vision of life. The meaning of life should be to connect to Krishna. And there is no loss or diminution, as we heard before. So anyway, so that's, really, that's what gives us ananda. Not these other things. You can possess the whole world, but you'll never get ananda. Just like it was Lord Jesus Christ who said, what profit of the man if he gains the whole world and loses, loseth his eternal soul? Of course, he didn't speak English like that, but we understand. I think he was speaking either Hebrew or Aramatic. Aramatic. Okay, so text 14. Sarvata pani patam tat sarvatok shi shiro mukam this is similar to many of the verses in the uh, Panishads. Sarvata, everywhere, pani, hands, padam, legs. Tat, that, sarvata, everywhere, akshi, eyes, shiraha, heads. 
Mukham faces, Sarvataha everywhere, Shrutimat, having ears, located in the world, Sarvam everything, Avrita covering, Tishtati exists. Everywhere are his hands and legs, his eyes and heads and faces, and he has ears everywhere in this way. The super soul exists, pervading everything. So, the class I was listening to, the Prabhupada was giving uh, this morning, uh, Prabhupada was saying that using the example is that you can't es escape from the guise of the sun or the moon. I mean, obviously, he was speaking uh, metaphorically, which you can escape from the guise of the moon. I can just lock myself in my house. The moon and the sun's not going to see me. But Prabhupada is giving the example that, that you're always being seen by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because even if you can escape from the moon and the sun, then you got at least artificial sun, these electric lights. You know, you, these are all manifestations of Krishna's energies. Purport, as the sun exists, diffusing its unlimited rays, so does the super soul or the supreme personality of Godhead. He exists in his all pervading form, and in him exist all the individual living entities, beginning from the first great teacher, Brahma, down to the small aunts. There are unlimited heads, legs, hands, and eyes, and unlimited living entities. All are existing in and on the super soul. Therefore, the super soul is all pervading. The individual soul, however, cannot say that he has his hands, legs, and eyes everywhere. No way. That is not possible. If he thinks that under ignorance, hmm, he is not conscious that his hands and legs are diffused all over, but when he attains to proper knowledge, he will come to that stage. His thinking is contradictory. So what that means is that if he actually had his hands, legs, and arms, and eyes everywhere, uh, he wouldn't be an illusion. <laughs> He'd be more powerful than an illusion. So it's contradictory. This means that the individual soul, having become conditioned by material nature, is not supreme. Exactly what I was just saying. That if you were supreme, you can't become unsupreme. <laughs> by the action of other elements. Impossible. The supreme is different from the individual soul. The Supreme Lord can extend his hand without limit. The individual soul cannot. In Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that if anyone offers him a flower or a fruit or a little water, he accepts it. If the Lord is far, a far distance away, how can he accept things? This is the omnipotence. Whoops. Hold on a second. This computer is giving me a hard time right now. Uh, let me just check. I should just check just to make sure. Give me a second because the computer did a little something funny. Okay. 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 In Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that if anyone offers him a fr fl fruit, flower, or the water, accept it. He said that this is the omnipotence of the Lord. Even though he's situated in his own abode, far, far away from earth, he can extend his hand to accept whatever anyone offers. That is his potency. In the Brahma Sanghita 537 or 537, it is stated, Goloka Eva Nivas Yakilatma Bhutaha. Although he is always engaged in pastimes in this transcendental planet, he is all pervading. The individual soul cannot claim that he's all-pervading. Therefore, this verse describes the supreme soul, the personality of God, and not the individual soul. So let me translate this verse again. Goloka. Goloka is the planet, the supreme planet in the spiritual world. Actually, literally means the planet of the cows, because that's what Krishna does there. Krishna is a transcendental coward boy. And it says, Goloka ah, eva nivashati. It means Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. So in other words, Krishna is always there in Vrindavan, and then he expands at the same time, his various expansions, Akilatma Bhuta, or 
even though he never leaves Vrindavan, he expands everywhere. Akilad Navuta. Hmm. Wonderful quality of Krishna. Which means he is inconceivable. Okay, text 15, which is similar description. Sarvendriya guna bhavsam sarvendriya vivarajitam asaktang sarvavichchaiva nirgunam guna bhoktracha. Sarva, of all indriya senses, guna, of the qualities of asam, the original source, sarva, all indriya senses, vivarajitam, being without asaktam, without attachment, sarva, brit, maintainer of everyone, cha, also, eva, certainly, nirgunam, without material qualities, guna, bhoktriya, the master of the gunas, cha, also. The super soul is the original source of all senses. In other words, our senses come because Krishna has senses and he allows us to manifest our senses. We're actually a chip off the old block. Just like uh, we have senses, our parents had senses, and our parents' parents had senses. Right? So if Krishna has senses, we should have senses because we are parts and parcels of him. We are tiny angsas, as described, Mamik Bangsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. We are very small parts and parcels, just like a drop of the water in a great ocean is actually of the same quality if the water was actually uniformly mixed. We're just assuming that. If the water was just uniformly mixed, uh, we are assuming that the drop would contain the same percentages of each and every element as the whole ocean, assuming uniformity. So in the same way, we are like a drop of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so we, we have the same percentages of the qualities that the Supreme Lord has. But our percentage, for example, 5% of a million and 5% of one are completely different. Although they're both 5%. Right? Wrong? Whatever. They're both 5%, but they're 5% proportionally of a different, larger or smaller quality, quantity, sorry. Okay. So, the super soul's original source, the entity is without senses, he is unattached, although he is the maintainer of all living entities, all living beings. He transcends the modes of nature, and at the same time, he's the master of all the modes of nature. So, transcends means he's not affected, but he controls them. It's very easy to understand. He's unattached because he, why is he unattached? He doesn't need anything. We have to be attached to something. I mean, better we attach to Krishna because we need him to be happy. Right, we need. It's an absolute positive need. We need Krishna to be happy. No doubt about it. But Krishna does not need anything else other than himself. Because he creates everything. And the perfect example of that is the story of Narayan Rishi, which we've told before, but you may have forgotten that story. Once upon a time, Krishna, in one of his multifarious incarnations, known as Narayan, along with his friends, and especially one friend named Nara, who in this particular case was an incarnation of Arjuna, okay, was meditating in the Himalayas. And as they were both meditating, or all of them were meditating in the Himalayas, the demigods started to get very worried. Now, why would the demigods be worried if someone's meditating? You think, you know, he's a peaceful guy, you know. How, or who is he going to hurt? But the demigods are worried because many times people are meditating, performing austerities, to go up to the heavenly planets and become one of the demigods and maybe even take over the top position of Indra. People do that. I mean, not nowadays too much. But at least traditionally yogis, you know, they had this intention. And so Indra, to avoid someone usurping his position, has different strategies to stop these meditating people. Well, his favorite strategy is to send down some beautiful girls to stop the yogi from meditating. 
It works. Pretty good strategy. So what he did is he sent down uh, some very beautiful, what we call upsellers. These girls from the heavenly planets. Anyway, he sent them down. He sent along with favorable, sent along with them favorable breezes, like springtime weather, uh, and even your friend, Cupid, who fires arrows. And the arrows are the objects of the senses, form, taste, smell, touch, etc. And so they went down there to, to deter Narayan and his friend Nara from performing austerities. So they came down, did their dance, played some music, the birds were chirping, chirp, chirp, chirp. And guess what? Narayan didn't even get affected, Nara didn't even get affected. They basically yawned and the demigods realized they had made a big boo-boo, big mistake. And so, instead of getting angry, Narayan, he produced a very beautiful girl, or a bunch of them, from his own energies. And he said to the demigods, you like one? Take him back with you. <laughs> Interesting story. And so, anyway, so they had made a mistake. Because the Supreme Lord doesn't need anything or anyone. He has everything he needs, and he's up to come, or whatever he wants, he gets immediately without asking anyone. He's not dependent. For example, we may be doing service for Krishna, but Krishna is not dependent on us for the service. It's not that we stop feeding the deity, that Krishna is just going to go hungry. Krishna is eating in so many different places. and Anyway, he's not hungry like that. He's hungry for our devotion. So, so therefore, we can say that Krishna is independent, which is what is mentioned here. He transcends the modes of nature. He's the master of the modes of nature, so he transcends the modes of nature. He's unattached. When you're completely self-sufficient and anything you want, you get, you're not going to be attached to anything. But he's attached to our love. Okay, Not material thing, but he's attached to our love. He wants us to love him because he loves us. Not because he's lacking love. You know, we may say, well, he's lacking love. But he loves us. And that's unconditional love. We talk about having unconditional love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna has unconditional love for us. Okay? The Supreme Lord, although the source of all the senses of the living entities, doesn't have material senses like they have. Actually, the individual souls have spiritual senses, but in conditioned life, they're covered with material elements, and therefore the sense activities are exhibited through matter. The example prophets sometimes would give is that we have this hand, right? Okay. And so sometimes we may put a glove on the hand, and then we can't really experience what the hand could normally experience. Now, for example, when I was young, we would play this... American game called baseball. And in baseball, you would put a glove. I even forget which hand. I think it was in the left hand. <laughs> I actually forget. No, it was in the left hand. It's been so many years. You put the glove on the left hand, and you couldn't really feel anything, which is pretty good because you'd catch a ball that was going real fast, and if you just had your hand, uh, it would have hurt your hand. Anyway, it's called a mitt. You, so... You, you couldn't feel the same thing. And sometimes you had to punch it, and you couldn't feel it that much. So in the same way, our senses are like covered, and the whole point is to uncover the senses so we can feel. And not just in a material sense, but uncover the material designations and covering that are keeping us from experiencing, feeling, seeing, smelling the spiritual world. The Supreme Lord's senses are not so covered. His senses are transcendental and therefore called Near guna, which means without the gunas. Gunas means what? Ropes. But actually, it refers to the three modes of material nature, which are called the gunas. Sattva, rajas, tamas. Uh, goodness, passion, and ignorance. These are the three ropes that entangle us. So, and cover our vision, too. So when your vision is covered with tamas, basically you don't see anything. When your vision is covered with Rajas, which is red, you just want to enjoy it. Anything is an enjoyable object. When your vision is covered with uh, 
material mode of goodness, you see everything is connected. And when it's uncovered, you see everything is connected to Krishna. Guna means the material modes, but its senses are without material covering. It should be understood that his senses are not exactly like ours, although he is the source of all the sensory activities. He has his transcendental senses, which are uncontaminated. This is very nicely explained in the Shvetasvata Upanishad 3.19 in the verse Apani Pado Javano Grahita. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has no hands which are materially contaminated, but he has his hands and he accepts whatever sacrifice is offered to him. Sometimes it's right. he has no hands or no legs, but he walks and he grasps things. Anyway, no material hands. That is the distinction between the conditioned soul and the super soul. He has no material eyes, but he has eyes. Otherwise, how could he see? He sees everything, past, present, and future. He lives within the heart of the living being, and he knows what we have done in the past, what we are doing now, and what is awaiting us in the future. So there's the point. Krishna knows the future. Wow. That doesn't mean it's predestined. No, it doesn't mean that. He knows what's going to happen in the future, but we're the ones who choose that future. So we choose, but Krishna knows which way we are going to choose. It's not a predestination. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. He knows everything, but no one knows him. It is said that the Supreme Lord has no legs like us, but he can travel throughout space because he has spiritual legs. In other words, the Lord is not impersonal. He has his eyes, legs, hands, and everything else, and because we are part and parcel of the Supreme Lord, we also have these things, but his hands, legs, eyes, and senses are not contaminated by material nature. They're so conditioned to our hands, legs, all the different senses, active, perceptive senses. They're so conditioned. If we get an injury, for example, we had a spinal cord injury, you'd lose feelings in different parts of your body or the ability to move in different parts of your body. Some people are paralyzed. So these are all conditioned, dependent upon certain circumstances. Bhagavad Gita also confirms that when the Lord appears, he appears as he is by his internal potency. He is not contaminated by the material energy because he's the Lord of material energy. In the Vedic literature, we find that his whole embodiment is spiritual. He has his eternal form called Satchananda Vigraha, Brahma Samhita 5.1. He is full of all opulence. We mentioned that before. He is the proprietor of all wealth and the owner of all energy. He is the most intelligent and is full of knowledge. These are some of the symptoms of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's the maintainer of all living entities. Hmm and the witness of all activity. As far as we can understand from Vedic literature, the Supreme Lord is always transcendental. Although we do not see his head, face, hands, or legs, he has them, and when we are elevated to the transcendental situation, we can see the Lord's form. Actually, that's one of the things that occurs due to chanting Hare Krishna. Wow. Nama, Guna, Rupa, Lila. So you're chanting the name. Okay. Nama. And then you begin to experience the qualities of the Lord. Eternity, bliss, and knowledge. And he passed, they began to picture his pastimes. That's guna, the qualities of the Lord. And then the next step is rupa. You see the transcendental form of the Lord, a tribanga laditam, a threefold bending form. And you see the forms of all the pure devotees and the spiritual realm. And uh, the next step is Leela. What does Leela mean? Leela basically means play. So you see Krishna's, you know, sometimes we translate Leela as activities, or Krishna's activities, but it actually means playful activities. We do not have Leelas right now in the material world. We're thinking, oh, uh, this is my Leela to go this is my Leela to go on the internet and talk to you all and, you know, be nice to you all at 5 o'clock our time every evening. That's not my Leela. It's my service. Leela means something. Of course, that is play to me. I mean, it's wonderful, but still, at the same time, Leela means something very specific. Something you're not obliged to do. Something that has no cause. 
something that you never get tired of. Hmm? Anything like that in the material world? No, there ain't no thing like that in the material world. But Krishna has his leela, his activities, that he has bliss from or happiness from. So due to materially contaminated senses, we cannot see his form. Therefore, the impersonalists who are still materially affected cannot understand the personality of Godhead. Okay, next verse. Vahiran tasya bhutana macharam chatave vacha sukshmatvata davigyeham dorastam chatike chatat Vahi, outside, anta, inside, cha, also, bhutanam, of all living entities, acharam, not moving, charam, moving, jay, but also, cha, and sukshma, but, on account of being subtle, tat, that, avigyam, knowable, hmm, durastam, far away, hmm. cha, also, antike, near, cha, and tat, that, the supreme truth exists outside and inside of all living beings. The moving and non-moving. There's non-moving beings, you know, like grass, trees, and being like that. They don't move. Of course, the wind blows them this way. But, but he exists as the super soul, and he also exists outside in many different forms. Uh, of course, as the material manifestation, indirectly, as we heard from universal form, and also in chapter 10 of the Bhagavad Gita. All the opulences are manifestations of Krishna, but Krishna personally exhibits as the Garbha Daksha Vishnu and also as the uh, Kshira Daksha Vishnu in each and every atom, and also as the Maha Vishnu, the universal, uh, not the universal, but the cosmic super soul. So Krishna is beyond, he is beyond the power of material senses to see or to know, although far, far away is also near to all. Far away because we can't perceive him. That's all. But he's here. He's with us. He's in our heart. But far away because for all intents and purposes, you can't see someone, you can't communicate with someone. They might as well be like a billion miles away. Purport. In Vedic literature, we understand that Narayan, the Supreme Person, is residing both outside and inside of every living entity. He is present in both spiritual and material worlds, although he is far, far away, he is still he is near to us. These are the statements of the Vedic literature. Asinal Duram, Rajati, Shayano, Yat Sarvadha, in the Katu Upanishad 1, 2, 21. Because he is always engaged in transcendental bliss, we cannot understand how he is enjoying this full opulence. We cannot see or understand with these material senses. Therefore, in the Vedic language, it is said, that to understand him, our material minded senses cannot act. But one who has purified his mind and senses by practicing Krishna consciousness and devotional service can see him constantly. Other than to a class, Prabhupada was talking about how even by doing external activities, you can get purified. He was arguing with the priest, and the priest was saying, But we've seen people do all these external activities and they don't get purified. Well, if you're engaged in the right external activities, even if you come for the wrong motive in the beginning, it will act. Like Prabhupada said, you put an iron rod in the fire, iron rod, iron rod gets hot, 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 hotter, and for all intents and purposes, acts like fire. So you begin to chant Hare Krishna. Whatever motive you have, you're chanting Hare Krishna, unless you're committing offenses, of course, then you'll get purified. Like, look at Dhruva. There's a story of Dhruva Maharaj. He wanted a kingdom greater than Lord Brahma. And he was chanting Krishna's name. Not specifically the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Om Namo Narayanaya. You know, Om Namo Bhagavate. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And he kept chanting it with this intention, which was really not so pure. But ultimately, when he saw Krishna, he said, I was looking for some broken pieces of glass, and now I've found a beautiful, wonderful gem. So that's the point. Even if externally you do the activities with some faith, with some interest, then the purification occurs as long as you don't commit offenses. Hmm. Okay. It is confirmed uh, in the Brahma Samhita that this devotee who has developed love for the Supreme God can see him always without cessation. And the verse is, Premanjana churi to bhakti vilochena in a shantakshadai veri eshu vilokianti, young shimashindamachincha guna swadupam gobinamari purisham tamaham bajami. That one who loves the Lord, 
Premanjana, his eyes are tinged, literally, the verse says, with the salve of love of your heart. <laughs> Just like in India, they put cudgel around the eyes. That's that black stuff. And they think it makes the kids look real cute. I'm not so sure, I agree. But anyway, in India, they put cudgel on the kids' eyes. So there's this thing called Premanjana, which is the ointment of love of God, which is metaphorically indicating love of Krishna. It's not like a material ointment you buy in the store. Can I have some Premanjana? And, and so people who have it on their eyes who love Krishna can see Krishna everywhere. On Santak Shiva Vidyeshu, in their heart of hearts, they're seeing Krishna and everywhere. And also they get a spiritual TV, uh, not some mechanism, but in their hearts there's a spiritual TV where they can close their eyes and see, observe Krishna's pastimes, wherever Krishna's pastimes are taking place, in whatever universe they want to see. It's uh, the perfection of cable TV. So anyway, as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 11th chapter, text 54, that he can be seen and understood only by devotional service. Remember the verse, Bhaktyam Tvananyaya Bhaktya. There is no other way to understand Krishna. And also in the Bhakti Mahamabhajananti Yavanyas Chasmi Tadvata. Only by undivided devotional service can I be understood as I am standing before you, Arjuna. Okay. So now we will go to questions and answers. If someone has, let me allow you to unmute yourselves. Give me one second. All right. Very nice. Okay. Okay. Who has an ecstatic question? They can uh, ask us. I do, sure, Greg. I do, sure, Greg. Okay, Jagat, <clears throat> our internet man. <laughs> Krishna here says that you talked about um, uh, Krishna knows the future, and he talked about in uh, the universal form, he showed Arjuna the past, present, and future. Yeah. And um, so does the past still exist? And if you say that it's just existent, uh, in abstract form, but does the past in its entirety exist in Krishna's mind? Uh, it exists in uh, because Krishna remembers it, or remembers it, or understands it. I mean, I don't want to say remember because Krishna is beyond time, place. He's beyond past, present, and future. So it exists in Krishna's mind. Yeah, everything that ever happened, and I wouldn't say that Krishna remembers it because that would be projecting our own particular uh, methodology of dealing with the past. But somehow or other, Krishna is cognizant, let's say cognizant. That would be a better word than remember. Because Krishna is beyond time. Of course, you're aware, I'm sure you're aware that Einstein said that past and future exist simultaneously. Yes. Yes, I'm aware he said that. It's not that I believe everything Einstein said. <laughs> Past and future. And, it, you know, the, it's hard to, I mean, mathematically, I do understand Einstein, but conceptually, I don't. Mm. You know, so there, there's a difference, because I, I just, you know, I just can't conceive of gravity being this bending of space-time. Mm. I mean, what does it mean? I mean, I know I can tell you what it means, but I don't conceive of it or picture it. Mm. You know, and I've seen plenty of diagrams where they have like the space time, which is like a, uh, like intercross lines and they start bending. Like a trampoline. Like a tra uh, trampoline, yeah. <laughs> or a spider web. Yeah. I've seen plenty of those diagrams, but actually to understand how time Time space can be bent. I mean, space can be bent. I can understand that, yes. I definitely can understand how space. You know, space can be compressed or expanded. I def that's really easy for me to understand that. But time? I really don't have space time. I don't even I don't understand it. I don't claim. I'm not claiming to understand it. I'm not claiming to be God. 
<laughs> but anyway, Krishna, Krishna knows everything past, present, and future. He exists beyond time. And in the spiritual world, it's always the eternal now. There's no past. There's no future. It's the eternal now. So you could say it, there's always the present. Yeah, eternal present. But it's not, it's not that you say, hey, yesterday... Uh, Yesterday we went to this forest, Krishna. Can we go to this forest today? You know, it's just like you're in so much because you're in so much ecstasy. For example, when you have a really intense emotional experience, you actually forget about past and future because you're absorbed. Like if you were ever to go, wherever go, uh, were to go uh, skydiving, and you're falling through the air. Someone sent me a message. If you're falling through the air, you're just like so absorbed in that rush of uh, wind going past your face and praying that your parachute will open up. <laughs> that you actually, you don't think about the past. So that's the spiritual world. They're just like absorbed in the ever now. And uh, it's fun. When you're having fun, you don't think about like, like when a kid's playing with his friends and having fun, he doesn't think about dinner or his homework or anything like that. So, all right. Einstein, he uh, yes, Einstein. Einstein believed in God also because he saw the order of the cosmos. He wasn't even aware of uh, microbiology to the extent that we're aware of today. But he was able to observe the order of the cosmos. How, and mathematically, I mean, if you, if you are really into mathematics, it's it's really beautiful. How it functions, uh, they say mathematics is the only pure science. Because other science, you can't prove any, you can't prove a damn thing. You can prove something to a certain degree of certainty, but not a hundred percent certainty. And. Uh, it's like Plato talked about the world of forms. Like in this world, there's no... I hope I'm not losing everybody else. But in this world, there's no perfect circle. There's no circle. Perfect circle. It's impossible. But in, in the world of forms, there's this perfect circle. So that's a mathematical circle. So I can, I can actually describe that circle in mathematical terms. And of course, of course pi, you can't. Anyway, you can go like to the 10 millionth digit with pi. <laughs> That's another point. But still, you can, you know, you, you can show, you can have an equation that will describe pi infinitely. Mm -hmm. If you process that equation through in, in a computer, a supercomputer, it'll keep on going and going and going. So you can actually describe pi mathematically. Even though, like when it comes down, when the rubber hits the road, so to speak, you can't really write down pi, you know, the full number of pi. Uh, for those of you who don't know what pie is, it's something you eat for dinner, for those of you who are watching this. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I don't eat because I don't eat sweets. So, No, it's actually a mathematical thing that has to do with the circle, you know, 3.14 or whatever, it goes on like that. So mathematics is actually, it's almost like the world of forms, Plato's world of forms in mathematics. So... So the point I'm getting to is that Einstein, he was into mathematics. When you talk about him being a scientist, he was more a mathematician than a scientist. You can't disconnect the two. But, but basically, he derived his uh, different theories, you know, E equals MC squared, which I also learned how to derive when I was in university. When you actually know the process, you can actually derive that particular theory. Uh, he derived that through mathematics, not by experimentation. He didn't go and start like exploding atoms or something, <laughs> taking little atoms and just piercing them with a pin until one exploded. You know, <laughs> he would have lost his whole laboratory and his life and everything else had he done that. But he actually he actually did everything mathematically. So he was a, he was almost like a pure mathematician. 
know, that's what people don't understand about Einstein. Now you've got other scientists like uh, Edison, who was more like hands-on type of thing. You know, Edison had his little phonograph. I mean, he knew some mathematics, and but he did, you know, the phonograph, I guess the microphone and whatever else, he did, a light bulb. Actually, there's a, there's a little controversy as to whether he was the one who first came up with the light bulb, or I think he came up with, with the tungsten filament on a light bulb before anyone else did, because everyone else's filament was burning out. Filament is the thing that's light on a light bulb before we had uh, the types of LED light bulbs that we have now. So, uh, so anyway, he was more of a scientist scientist, or a practical scientist, whatever you may call him. But Einstein was a mathematician. You know, because I studied Einstein in, in uh, university, and it's just pure mathematics. So pure mathematics describes a world that we can never see in this world. So anyway, so <laughs> spiritual world. So anyway, so there's certain mathematical constructs that we can not ever understand, never understand. Like you have a ten-dimensional algebra calculus. I mean, how do you understand it? Or, or ten-dimensional uh, geometry. I don't know if anyone here that has ever studied geometry. You know, geometry actually comes from the word earth, the measure of the earth, geometry, if you think about it. Uh, so geometry is the study, basically, of measures, you know, like the right triangle and the circle and all that other stuff. That's geometry. So anyway, I don't know if I should go all this stuff. It's just gonna, everyone else is gonna think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the geometry. Anyway, so, so, so getting to the point of geometry and multi dimensional geometry, you've got a mathematics that can describe 100 different uh, dimensions in geometry. Not, not, not just mathematics, but uh, multi dimensional ge geometry. And that is. And it's used all the time. It's not a completely useless, like, harebrained thing. It's used in designing computers and other things. You know, the multidimensional ge geometry. But you can't conceive of what it means. So, so anyway, so the point is... I don't know what the point is. But the point... <laughs> the, the, point is, the point is these things are inconceivable. To us, what it means, space, you know, because we started talking about space time and the bending of space time. It's inconceivable. Even, even mathematical expressions are, in, the higher level of mathematical expressions are inconceivable to us. What to speak of the spiritual realm? Now, now that I've confused everybody, so who, who else has an interesting question that's not so confusing? Hare Krishna <laughs> Hare Krishna, Bhai Chaitanya, it's good Hare to Krishna see you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Dandabad Pranam, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, yeah, my, question, my question is probably not as scientific as, <laughs> as what you yeah, just yeah. answered. It's, it's just, um, uh, you know, in, in the Gita where Lord Krishna says uh, that, um, um, you know, he's situated in, in all our hearts and he's directing our wanderings and, and really he's, you know, we think we are the doer, but he's the doer. And how, how do we reconcile that with also the fact that um, uh, we, on the other hand, we are responsible, individual souls responsible for our own actions and have the free will? Yeah. So How do we so, reconcile that? Yeah. Well, uh, Krishna is the doer, but we're the one who are deciding. <laughs> for example, <laughs> uh, we do have free will. And in the 15th chapter, which we haven't gotten to yet, uh, there's a description 1550 uh, that yeah. that according to our desire, Krishna gives us intelligence. So he's the doer, but we're, dis we're actually using our free will to determine how we want to get directed by Krishna. Krishna is the one who's directing us. Krishna is the one who's giving us the strength. Krishna is the one who's giving us the intelligence. Krishna is giving us whatever, you know, the force or whatever else. Uh, you know, we already said strength. But we're, so we, in that way, Krishna is a doer, but we're the ones who are deciding to do. Mm. 
as far as our individual lives are concerned. I mean, for example, let, let's use a mundane example. Let's say I, I desire to lift my hand. You know, my hand is going up. Uh, am I actually doing it? I think I'm desiring to do it, and that Christians arrange the elements in the body and the nervous system and everything like that. It's right. not that I am. It's not that I am lifting my hand. So, so he's sense. facilitating it. Is, he's is facilitating what that. Right. Yeah. It's Krishna. Yeah. The reason I'm lifting my hand is Krishna has has given me the facility, but he is the one who's doing it through his energy. Right. Like when Krishna, let's say, if Krishna decides not to do it, I won't be able to lift my hand. And that's a good example, Maharaj. Right. Yeah. I get paralyzed. So, so I'm not the one who's actually lifting my. Although, you know, if I tell that to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, they'll think I'm crazy. If I say, you know, I'm not the one lifting my hand. I'm desiring to lift my hand, but really, do I know how it's happening? I mean, it's very. If you analyze it, really, what's happening? You know, there's, there's, of course, my brain and there's the nervous system. Yeah. And then all these little muscle cells that are contracting. I mean, it's really an amazing complex arrangement for me to lift my hand. And I don't even have to think about it. Like you got muscle cells here that are contracting, mm. muscle cells there that are expanding, these little tiny muscle cells. Yeah. And they're all getting those messages, not only electrical messages, but electrochemical messages. And each one of those cells there's all these different things going. So if you look, study cellular biology, in each and every cell, there's there's billions and billions of different mechanisms. Yeah. Happening. So I, Just so I can lift my hand, but I'm not the one doing it. Am I telling? I'm not controlling those cells. I'm not control, controlling anything. I'm desiring to do it. And Krishna has given me the ability. Krishna also says, "I'm the ability in man. I'm the strength of the strong, uh, the intelligence of the intelligent." So it's actually, you know, Krishna is the doer, although he's allowing me to think that I'm the doer at this particular yeah. point. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Thank you so much for explaining that. All right. Okay. Nice question, Vai Chaitanya. Vai Chaitanya just took initiation the other day. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> we're uh, we're going to be having another internet. So many people got interested in internet uh, initiations. So one of one of my uh, disciples in India, some of you may know her, Goramani, has been cultivating people to be initiated for the last several years through her music, and I think in about a week or two from now, there's going to be at least what she told me today, maybe more, maybe less, seven to ten people taking initiation uh, in India, and she she of course is the Shiksha Guru. And she's she's cultivating people all over India. It's really great. I mean, she's doing such a good job. And then, so we're going to have this initiation and people, yeah, of course, it's going to be in Hindi. So she's going to translate and have her also give a lecture in addition to me. And uh, this will be sometime next week, I think. You know, she's planning on it right now. So this is very exciting, the, using the internet for so many things. It's amazing. Amazing technology, key job. Anyway, technology is, is a manifestation of Krishna. Eventually, eventually we're going to get inter, we're going to get internet pets and uh, like, like mechanical pets, mechanical cats. So <laughs> this is a joke. It's an inside joke with I have, I have with someone who's watching tonight. They can just remove the batteries at night. So anyway, <laughs> in Japan they already have that. In Japan, they actually have like a dog, you know, in, not internet, of course. It's a, some sort of a robot dog, robo dog, and robo men and robo girls. This is what society is coming to because people have, people don't have any fulfilling relationships. So at least they want to have a relationship with someone they can turn off at night. Anyway, on that happy note, we will see everybody uh, tomorrow, sometime, tomorrow, same time, same station, continue our study of the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you very much for joining us. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada.